Hello and welcome to another edition of Press Row on Rivalry Family Media. I'm Todd Robbins. Happy to have you along with us for another edition of Press Row and happy to be joined today by a couple of great special guests from the sports broadcasting industry. Joining us first here in segment number one, Andre Koroskini, Lemonster born and bred now traveling broadcaster of sorts. He's a camera operator for ESPN as well as broadcast technician. Andre, great to have you here and looking forward to talking a lot about the broadcast industry and of course where we are in, in this crazy world of COVID-19 with sports essentially shut down. Yeah, thanks for having me, Todd. This is uh, definitely an interesting time with everybody, and um, hopefully we can uh, shed some light on uh, what the future might hold. No, uh, no question about that. I, I always say there's a five to one ratio between on-air personalities and folks behind the scenes in order to make it happen. And it might be a little short on that five to one number, okay. but uh, there yeah. are a lot of you right now who are all feeling the same thing. You're, you're all kind of at home on standby waiting for what's going to come next. Yeah, who knows? I mean, uh, you know, everybody's in a different situation between um, the people who are furloughed or the freelancers that were just uh, released off their, their shows. Um, definitely, hopefully, there's some good news coming in with the sports leagues um, trying to get together on some information. But specifically with us, yeah, the waiting game, day by day, it's, it's really difficult. But, um, you know, hopefully there's uh, sports in the end, you know, and we can actually broadcast again. That's what we, uh, we keep saying. Sports will come back one day, and in the meantime, we'll just do shows on Zoom. That's uh, kind of where we're at <laughs> uh, at, uh, at yeah. this point in, uh, in time. Nothing we can, uh, we can do about that. But I want to talk a little bit about the background, because I, I know the first thing you said to me when I, when I asked you, of course, to, uh, to be a part of the, uh, the episode was, uh, I don't crave the spotlight. I know that. That's because most people don't know what you guys do as, as technicians. That's why you choose that role. You have a, a creative angle and a huge you know, effort in as far as putting together a broadcast, but you, you you got humble beginnings right here in Lemonster, obviously got started locally, involved in access television and community media. And now you, you found your way to this fantastic traveling road show of a job. It's not like you go to a studio or an office every day. Right. Um, you literally hit the airport and fly to whatever your next location is to work. Yeah. I mean, going from the back, like LA TV has been a, it was obviously a great launching point. Um, Mount Wachusett Community College, great broadcasting program. So underrated. They don't get enough credit. Art Collins does a great job there. Uh, I think John Little right now is the, the head of the department. Um, so, yeah, the great foundation there locally um, to, like, you know, honestly, you could either travel, you could work locally in, in Boston or New England. Um, it's, been a, it's been an interesting run. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm – normally I'm, like, you know, super busy, and, and it's been, like, such a uh, – on the go kind of thing where it's, it's, I'm actually kind of glad where you bring it back to home because I haven't really been able to go back to the college and, and even see Carl Pamarini at LA TV and all that. So uh, I definitely need to do more of that. And uh, we can obviously share more about that later. No, uh, no question about that. I, I'm trying to, of course, with, uh, you know, we'll get back to the COVID piece in a minute. I, I want to kind of hear yeah. about, and I know the audience would be interested here, what's the average day like for you, you know, in, in a broadcast week or maybe even the average broadcast week? Because, of course, again, it's not like Monday you punch the clock, Tuesday you punch the clock, you've got, a, you know, maybe a broadcast, a few days layoff, and then another one and so forth. What, what's the average week look like at this time of year normally? So I'll try to generalize it for all freelancers. Um, I have, I have a contract specifically with some networks, um, especially ESPN. Um, so I do have, I have to work for them um, per year. Uh, but on the normal like side, yeah, like it's for me, um, you know, it's usually hopping on a plane Saturday night for Sunday night baseball, um, fly home Monday, Tuesday, fly back out for Wednesday night baseball, fly home Thursday, uh, get a couple of uh, days of rest and re do it all over again. So normally for me, baseball is my busiest season. It's a, it's a long run, but I enjoy the sport. And um, so that's the traveling side. On the other, on the other side, there are guys that work, you know, like Nesson, they, uh, you know, they do a home, a home stand. There'll be like eight to 10 games. Um, so that is a little bit more of like staying home back and forth. And the hours are ranging anywhere from, you know, a 10 hour day to a 16 hour day. So um, it's, it's definitely, uh, this has definitely been a change for me being home, uh, going back to the traveling part. Like, yeah, that's, you know, I'm on the plane. I feel like, um, I'm on the plane probably twice a week. So, uh, you know, going back and forth from Logan and then sometimes I've been coming home in between and just going direct to the next city. So, uh, schedule has to be flexible with sports broadcasting holidays. 
Um, you know, how many times I've uh, wished you guys a happy Thanksgiving on uh, LH, uh, LATV and, um, and um, you know, your radio broadcast and whatnot. So, you know, it's, you have to be flexible. Uh, it's a long grind. There are times to take off. You kind of have to set up your own schedule to be able to, you know, have some sort of home life. And um, some people are as busy as I am and some people are a lot less busy. So uh, especially with the traveling part, that's kind of up to you and how you want to handle that. You've certainly taken advantage of the opportunity being young uh, to uh, to enjoy those those times of travel while, while you can and pay those dues. Uh, talk to me about arriving in a city. You, you arrive in a city, you know, obviously camera operator seems very straightforward to people. But what's it like when you first get to a facility before the game even begins? Um, yeah, so in the morning, it's like, you know, say that we have a seven o'clock broadcast, uh, just baseball, for instance. Um, yeah, we're there either eight in the morning, nine in the morning, uh, get everything set up. Uh, and that entails unloading this giant 18 wheeler um, full of equipment um, that we need to use uh, audio video equipment uh, and then we have to put it in the stadium and there the stadiums are usually um, pretty accommodating where we put our cameras they usually have like locations already set up for us um, but yeah it's it's a long day it's um, hopefully everything's set up by one o'clock two o'clock we still have a lot of pre-production to do uh, maybe like on-field interviews before even batting practice starts. Then next thing you know, we're into uh, the batting practice and the coverage of that. And um, yeah, it's it's a long day. It's a long day. And you're seemingly in and out and you make the place look like it did before you guys even <laughs> arrived by the time you reach the end uh, of a day as well. When you're out there shooting and obviously the, the game gets going and, and you, a lot of the times, of course, keeping up with you on, on social media, seems like people post pictures of you. You're on the move. So you're more of a, a mobile camera operator. How does yeah. that differentiate being on the move, mobile, not tied down to any one single location? Great question. Yeah. Um, I think I enjoy running handheld. That's the, the, um, the wireless camera or even wired camera that moves around the stadium. I uh, definitely prefer the wireless camera in the crowd. Uh, there's nothing like it, especially in the bigger moments, um, especially being on the field during like uh, the World Series or something like that. That's a really cool moment. Um, you, just, you just can't experience it from any other perspective than being on the field and just being in, in the middle of it. And it's, you're still doing a job, but it's, it's sometimes you're like, that was, that was cool, especially when you watch this broadcast back or something that's, you know, you can definitely, um, you know, that's definitely different in the, in the sense of the remote camera, you know, moving around and, and the fixed camera that you stand behind, you know, there's all different perspectives. You're usually in the crowd or somewhere, maybe next to the dugout um, or anywhere in the stadium just to, we, we move these cameras around these stadiums just to make sure we, we document the game and whatever that, you know, whether it's going to be a great pitching performance, we think, or, you know, it could be a, a slugfest. We try to put our cameras around in the best situations to uh, document it for everybody. No question about that. And the variety of angles that we're able to see uh, more and more and more often, obviously, with more and more production uh, being put into that uh, is, is rather incredible. But, you know, you as an individual, obviously, are working as part of a large whole. In some cases, you're taking instruction on what you're looking for. But in a lot of cases, each camera operator kind of has a, a bit of a, a freedom to be able to grab something and provide it back, obviously, to the truck for them to, to take. What, what are you looking for when you want to capture something? What would you say is a signature Andre shot that we're looking at? <laughs> uh, out of the norm. I like, uh, I'm much more of the freelance kind of guy, uh, use my instincts. Um, I think the directors that I work with, you're totally right. There's a vision of the show, um, but you also have to, these the great directors just trust their cameras in the sense that here's, here's the idea of where, how we want to cover whatever sporting event it is but also you have to use your instincts. And um, that is probably my number one attribute of the reason why I've developed that availability is always a, a good thing to have. But um, as you develop with different directors, um, yeah, the, the, the freedom of, of using your instincts and that, that starts with the director and producer to allow me to, to do that. Cause I'll work on another show that the director, you can definitely tell it's got a little bit more of a, a strict vibe and it's their vision and you got to stay in your lane and sometimes that's that's the key that the fun part of those those working for those directors are still finding your little moments in a broadcast that's just not like the ordinary shot and um, I guess that's the challenge. 
Of course, John Chambi will be joining us in a, in a couple of moments to continue our, our conversation. But before I, I wrap up the, and take our first break here, Andre, I, I've known you for a very, very long time since you were a young little league baseball player. And of course, that makes me <laughs> therefore older than you by a significant amount. Um, but, but for that said, you've always had a passion for the sport of baseball. Uh, and obviously, to have this opportunity to work in the sport, uh, how would you describe this dream realized? <sighs> It's, it's amazing, honestly. Um, how to describe it? I mean, it's just imagine your passion from, a, from being a kid and, and then just living it out. Um, I think everybody can have that passion, whatever they want to do. Um, you know, and that's just what, for me, it's, it's baseball. Sports has always been connected for me. Uh, my dad always thought I was going to be a statistician, keeping score for baseball at home. Um, you know, used to buy me books online, the, the scorecard books, just, I would just watch Red Sox games, keep score. So I always thought, you know, it was going to be like a statistician or some sort of analytical, you know, department, but no, I ended up being uh, more of the technical side, which I think playing uh, baseball for that long uh, has helped me be a, a better camera operator. And that opportunity, we certainly will get an opportunity to see and enjoy. Andre, looking forward to continuing the conversation. We'll, uh, we'll take a quick break. Andre will stay with us. John Shambi joins us when we continue. You're watching Press Row here on RFM. We know that we're asking Americans to do a lot right now. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible to this virus. A question I often get asked is why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. Social distancing is really physical separation of people. It's what we refer to when we ask people to stay at least six feet apart. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants, not going to theaters where there are a lot of people. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others who might actually be infected or infect you. We all have a role to play in preventing person-to-person -person spread of this disease, which can be deadly for vulnerable groups. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. Back here on our at-home edition of Press Row here on Rivalry Family Media, I'm Todd Robbins. Happy to have you along with us, continuing our conversation on the world of sports broadcasting, and now happy to be joined not just by Andre Cora, skinny freelancer for ESPN and others, but also joined now by ESPN play-by-play -play personality John Shambi. John, taking a break from Korean baseball to join yeah. us for a little at-home conversation. We appreciate your take of the time. You bet. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, a, it's my pleasure. Uh, a little more reasonable time, by the way, uh, you know, in, in the afternoon Eastern time here. Uh, so certainly not uh, a scenario where uh, you're working at these new crazy hours. Of, I mean, no, nothing better than live sports at 1 or 5.30 a.m. Eastern. I thought you were going to ask me, you know, would you be willing to come on at like 2.30 a.m.? And at this point, my sleep is so upside down that I probably would have been like, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> yeah, not, not a problem at all. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm, I'm sure when they send you the schedule now, you, don't, you have to ask a.m. or p.m. Yeah, it, it's, it's crazy, but it's, you know, it's the world we live in at the moment. So what are you going to do? I, uh, I hear that indeed. For our Massachusetts audience, you have a, a local Massachusetts connection. You're a graduate of, of Boston College. Uh, let's start there. Tell us about your time on the Hill. So I went to BC from 89 to 92. I started at William & Mary, transferred to BC. And uh, while I was there, uh, the same time, Bob O'Shusen and Joe Testator were also broadcasters there. So the three of us did sports. So we did basketball, football, hockey, and we also collectively hosted a, a sports radio show. Although looking back, I don't know how there was enough oxygen for the three of us. Because, <laughs> I mean, you talk about three people. I mean, it's three people that like to talk and I, one more than the next. So, but we, you know, we learned how to be on the air. It was a great experience. And, you know, the t I love Boston. I, I grew up, I was born in Philadelphia. I moved to New York when I was seven. I consider myself a New Yorker, but I love Boston. Boston has always, since my time going to school there, it's always felt comfortable. There's a part of Boston that's always, that's always felt like home to me. So I, I, I really love the city. 
I could certainly appreciate that. And you're, of course, talking about your time with, with Joe and Bob on campus. I, I think about my, my own years, you know, talking to, to folks at Syracuse, and we always said, you know, there was this dream that we'd all, you know, work at a national network together one day. You're actually getting to live that dream yeah. with, a, with a couple of your colleagues. And while you don't work necessarily directly together, because all three of you do a very similar job and wouldn't be at the same site at the same time, what's it like? I can imagine you had those conversations where, where you guys wanted to be, and, and you've gotten there. Right. It's funny. I, somebody recently asked about it. I don't think we all just really liked sports and we were just kind of steamrolling ahead. And I don't think we contemplated that we wouldn't be good enough or what it might look like to take us to certain places. Um, we just did it. And now every once in a while, I think back to those times and think about where we are now and it's pretty nuts that we were all on campus at the same time. And we've, you know, we've done some pretty cool things. So I, I, I'll tell you this much. If you could go back in time and tell the three of us, here's what you'll be doing now. I think all of us would be like, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, uh, no question about that. You got your start, as you were mentioning, at that campus radio station, WZBC. And I think all of us, you know, who got a start in, in radio or in television, got a start in student media. How important is that opportunity as a launching point to, uh, to eventually reaching the heights that you have? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is you learn to be on the air. You got to go be on the air, period. That's the thing that, that jumped out at me was that I was just learning how to be comfortable with a microphone in front of me. So I, it was invaluable and so that when, you know, you move into the professional realm, you'd already been on the air. You know what it was like when the light goes on, so to speak, and, um, and when a microphone was in front of you and how to think on your feet and, and do it that way. So I think that that was really the, the part about it. We wanted to be on the air as much as we possibly could, and it, it served us because it's just that reps and training. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things, getting reps – you know, for guys who want to do baseball play-by-play, -play, I always say, you know, go somewhere and just go get the reps. You know, for me, it started, I did games. But baseball was the one sport that I didn't do in college. So when I was in Miami, I would go to Marlins games and do games into a tape recorder. And that started my path. I did games into a tape recorder, eventually gave somebody a tape, eventually got a minor league job, and then eventually got a major league. And those uh, pieces come together. There are logical steps along the way. One thing, of course, your, your brand, if you will, the John Shambi brand, comes with this great nickname of Boog uh, that you have no problem uh, using and introducing yourself as uh, on the air as well. Folks, of course, are, are going, Boog, Boog, who? Who's this Boog yeah. guy? Tell me, where'd this nickname come from? I love that you just said that I have a brand. That is <laughs> yeah. Don't make his head any bigger than it already is. Come on. Come on. Got to establish your media brand. Yeah. But, the funny thing is, is I actually don't know the story, so I'm, I'm intrigued. Well, I, so I, it's, there, there's, there is a delineation in terms of what, how people speak to me, the way, what they call me. So for, for any girls that are, that knew me from 13 and younger, they all call me Jonathan. So... Like there's a there's a newscaster in in New York City at local WABC named Lauren Glassberg who's super talented, my first crush. Um, but so whenever I see her, she always she calls me Jonathan. And all the the people I grew up with when I was a when I was a, a kid when I went to high school, most people called me by my last name. In college, most people called me by my last name or shorten it to from Shambi to Shams. Um, and then, and then when I got to WQAM, when I was living with Bob Wachusen in Miami, I went in, I was training on the morning show. Uh, my first day there, my bell box said, John Shambi. One of the two guys who was hosting the morning show was Dave Lamont, who does stuff for ESPN. And Dave is from the DC area, he's a huge Orioles fan. And he said, you look like Boog Powell. And the next day I came in and my mailbox taped over John Chambi was Boog Powell. <laughs> that was it. I don't introduce myself a ton as Boog because I just, I don't feel like explaining it for the people that won't get it. So I say John, but then everyone around me usually picks up on it, figures out, okay, they're all calling me Boog. 
So that's, that's how it happens. So it's, it's a nickname I got when I was 23. And most everybody that I've met since 23 um, call me Boog. And there are a few exceptions here or there. But for the most part, that's, that's kind of how it works. So we'll definitely hear it on a baseball broadcast. Don't be looking for it on college football. Yeah, I don't, I mean, it's, it, I would say that I, I'll, people are always going to call me Boog. They just are. But I, I, I probably on the air, I would say one out of every three times will refer to myself as Boog Shambi, usually more John Shambi in the, in the formal, at least that's how we do it in the brand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, uh, no question about that. You also occupy this really neat dual role at ESPN, particularly for baseball, in that you call baseball both on the radio and on television. Uh, yeah. And for, for people who are uninitiated in the world of play-by-play, -play, they're like, okay, but it's still baseball. Um, those are two very different jobs. In one case, you're painting a picture. In another, you're trying to fill in what people can't see. What do you see as the difference? Do you have a preference? Do you like one versus another? Everybody always wants me to pick both because, it, and, and I just, I really, I really love that I get to do both because it exercises two different skill sets. You know, you talked about describing what you're seeing, painting the picture on the radio. And when you do that in a complicated manner and yet still you're able, or a complicated picture and you're able to deliver it in the moment, you know, it, it's really cool and fun and do that while telling stories, engaging your analysts. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a pretty neat thing. It's like, I mean, this is a apples to oranges, but it's like, if you're really good at packing a suitcase and you're just able to fit all this stuff in there because you're skilled enough in efficiently describing what's in front of you. And it's immensely satisfying. Um, and I like to play, you know, that's, that's the thread with both. I, you know, Andre knows I, I like to play, man. I want to have fun. I want them oh, yeah. to hear the smile. Um, in yeah, my come voice. on, pick, sut or singing right now. <laughs> yeah. I, that's I, his, I, uh, his I, TV, uh, yeah, Rick color and, uh, is my, singing is my is, uh, guy on, on TV and Chris Singleton on, on radio. And then on TV, I have, we have a great producer in Jeff Dufine that we, for the last six, seven years now, he's moved on to Sunday Night Baseball. But, you know, he trusts me with influencing the content. I had definitely have a little bit of an analytics bent to me. I like all the Bill James stuff. But I like to tell stories. I like to have fun. If I am, you know, the butt of the joke, I feel like my job is to make it as funny as possible um, once we're in that. And I'm, I think in both cases, I think I'm good at making the person next to me feel comfortable. And so getting them to speak in a manner where, you know, they're just honest and open and, and, and talking how they talk. And so they, they access different things, radio and TV, and I love that I get to, to do both of them. I wouldn't want to give up one for the other. I really wouldn't. I could certainly appreciate that. And, of course, the world has changed significantly in the world of sports broadcasting over the, uh, the last handful of weeks and now to months as uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has shut down sports significantly to the point where, of course, we went without any form of live sports for, for a matter of, of weeks. And then, of course, there's been these little trickles back. And, of course, uh, you know, you both were in the process of starting your spring training. Right when this all kind of went down, you, you guys were getting to that point where you were ramping up for the season, Andre, I'll give you the first crack at this, and, and then we'll uh, we'll hear from John. You know, where where were you at the time when you found out this was going on, and, and of course, how did that of course change things, and what was the scenario like playing out when the when the shutdown came, and it was okay, we're done. So actually, I was working the last ESPN NBA game, um, the one that was right before I think it was a Sacramento game that got canceled, right after us, but I was in Dallas, and uh, yeah, right on right in our broadcast is when everything went down. I mean, from like Europe travel ban, Tom Hanks got in his wife, like everybody just like all the news just, just um, went in order right from honestly our tip off. So I'd say right around third quarter is when we got the, uh, the word from Woj 
um, that they were going to cancel the season or suspend it. And uh, in that moment, we were trying to capture, we had uh, Mark Cuban in our sights to, uh, to see if we were going to capture his reaction. And we ended up getting the money shot of him looking at his phone, walking around, showing everybody the refs. I mean, it was unbelievable. That night, probably one of the most unforgettable events was, uh, was kind of just going through our little game, but with a much larger story be involving in the middle of some basketball game that probably was going to not really matter anymore. So uh, that night, unforgettable. And then uh, the following day is when the, I flew home and that was it for us. We were done. We were off the, what off camera the did you have? Where were you? What, what, what were you, did you shoot him? So I had uh, the right slash. We were a smaller show for uh, a normal NBA, NBA size show. So we only had a few cameras. And uh, unfortunately, I, I, we were, it was like, I want to say during like a break. So I was focusing on Mark near the huddle. It was kind of yeah. like tough people walking in front of my angle. It was from a slash angle, like to the right of where the basket is. And uh, I ended up keying in and our other uh, camera operator on um, camera two was up top, had a much better angle. And we caught him. It was, that was the, that was the look. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And then just. Captured. Unbelievable. I remember that. You got, you got him looking at his phone and going. Yeah. That, and pointing at his phone, pointing the person next to him, yeah. getting up, bringing the phone over. It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing was, TV. It was, it's unforgettable. It's, it's, it was newsworthy. I remember even shooting um, pregame. Um, just people passing out hand sanitizer and all that stuff. Like we, that we were trying to capture our game, but as I was shooting outside and thinking of all this stuff that I'm like, not knowing this was going to be the last game, yeah. but I just remember shooting a lot of extra stuff just, just in case in a more of a news type manner for stock footage. You never, you, you didn't know it was, it was, I mean, we kind of knew something was going to happen like regarding the fans, not potentially being allowed in anymore. So we were kind of capturing that. And then as the night developed, it ended up being, a, you know, season suspension. So there were, there would be no sports. And John, where were you at the time? I was in Arizona. I was just, I was doing, you know, preseason work at camps, just going around talking to players and visiting with teams and managers and, and GMs. And yeah, I had, they, they, it was the fourth, no, yeah, it was the twelfth, I think, when they they said that they were going to shut it down. And so it was a Thursday, and then I was kind of figuring out. Okay, I had an idea. I live in New York City; it's where I am right now. That New York was going to kind of be an epicenter, you know. But if I didn't go home, did I want to get shut out of being able to go home? And I made the choice to go the next day. I flew home. Um, and so that was – that's what I did. And I'm glad I did. I mean, it's – you know, there were some stretches here in New York City that were scary. But home's home. And, I, you know, this is – you got all your stuff here and, and most of my friends and family, uh, you know, close by, even though that's, you know, more about a feeling because I haven't – you know, I go and walk with my brother, you know, socially distanced from time to time and see a couple other people, but, but not too many. That means the both of you, of course, experienced what travel was like. I think most people before all of this thought travel was, uh, you know, a nightmare when snow would show up or, or bad weather would show up. Now we have a, a pandemic where people aren't sure who has it and where it is. Uh, what was that experience like traveling uh, on the ride back? I'm not sure. I was a little anxious, but I would say if, if you had made me fly – 10 days later, I think my anxiety level would have been much higher. I don't know that I quite, quite fully grasped. I mean, I, I, I had an idea and I was antsy about touching things and so forth, but I, it hadn't quite laid out at that point. So I don't know that I, that I, totally, that I totally got it. I don't think I, I'm not a naturally anxious person. Um, but, you know, for, like I said, the three weeks here, there was a good three to four weeks, sort of March 20th to like April 5th, that just everything you touched, you know, even with a mask on, you're like, did I touch my face after that? Did I sanitize my hands quickly enough? So that, <clears throat> but the flight back wasn't too stressful. 
I'll jump in. I, I honestly, um, we went into the Sky Club that next morning with a lot of us on the same flight going from Dallas to Atlanta to connect to wherever we were going. And I want to say that we walked in and there were like another 10 um, TV freelancers from another sporting event that was happening uh, in Texas. And they were doing like some soccer thing, whatever. We were also all talking about where you guys were going. Some people were going home. Some people were going to another site. And uh, I'll tell this quick story. A buddy of mine, he ended up having to fly to, it was either Orlando or Miami. He wasn't sure, but it was a soccer event. And, um, uh, and ended up at literally landing hearing the cancellations turn around. So we ended up actually on four flights that day. Oh. It was the 12th of March, I think it was. Yeah. But yeah, it, I didn't know. I don't know if I was anxious that day or any of us were really anxious that day because it was kind of like, I don't know. It was a, a it's funny though. So you, I mean, so we flew the same day, man. It was the Thursday, right? It was that Thursday. Yeah. 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 So I, so I, I flew, I flew Friday. Yeah. You know what? I take that back. I, I found out Thursday, but I flew Friday. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah. One thing you, uh, you both have been experiencing is that extended time at home. At this point, you'd both be a traveling road show bouncing from site to site and location to location with maybe a hit at home in between, uh, especially here in the, in the month of May where your seasons would really be ramping up. What's the extra time at home been like? Have, have you been enjoying that extra time? I mean, I, the thing for me is that my first year as a minor league broadcaster was 96, big leagues was 97. So in terms of being home like this, this time of year, you know, 1995 was the last time that I was at home for this extended, it, it's just weird, you know, and here I'm not, you know, I'm picking my spots to go out and that type of thing, but I've, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really different, really odd. And you're trying to figure out what your, your new routine is. Andre is snickering at both of us because in 1995, I'm not sure what he was doing, but I know he was younger at that point in time, Andre. <laughs> but what's the extra time at home been like for you? Uh, odd. Uh, and John hit it exactly this specific season. I mean, this is the season we're on the run. Um, especially with the playoffs, NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs. We would have had the, the marathon last month. It would, it would have been so busy for everybody, especially locally in the market, let alone the, the traveling. So, yeah, at home it's been interesting. I've been cooking and Amazon shopping and working out, bought a total gym. <laughs> right? but, uh, yeah, just it's been odd. It's been really, really odd just uh, being home specifically in the warmer as it gets warmer, the warmer months. You working on your ground balls? Yeah. <laughs> right here, baby. <laughs> Where are you me the other day. I figure you're going to have a ball in your hand. Come on. Coverage of two I, I kids with sticks playing, uh, <laughs> coming from Andre and his cell phone, coming soon uh, until we can, uh, can get him going. Uh, but uh, but with, that, with that said, John, you're, you're sitting at home, sitting idle, of course. ESPN's running Endless Sports Center and, uh, you yeah. know, uh, 30 for 30s and, and any kind of, you know, old game they can. And then somebody comes to you and says, John, here's what we got for you. You know, we've got baseball going on in Korea. Yeah. So here's what we want you to do. From your house, we're going to give you the equipment. You're going to start calling Korean baseball. What was your initial reaction okay I mean I, that you know it, it's it wasn't uh it, it wasn't as I mean look it, it it's let's be clear it's not like the way it was presented was hey here's an idea it was hey this is what you're gonna do you know so right. that's what you do well, um, we had. yeah it's what you have so it's really different. Um, it's probably as challenging as anything I've ever done. I'll, I'll add this. Whatever yeah, sport comes back first, I'm in. You know, whatever it's KBO, baseball, whatever it is, I think going with that, I think anybody would have just said, sure. Uh, you know. Yeah. Lawn games, I'll broadcast it. Why not? Just sure. Just to get going, you know. Yeah, any, anything to get the uh, the productivity going. And I immediately jumped to when I when I thought about this, John, and I thought about what would I want to ask you about. As a play-by-play -play guy, I'd be thinking game prep. And I mean, game prep, as much information as you can get is helpful, um, especially when it's in your native language. And yeah. now you have to go. And uh, how's your Korean? 
Uh, I mean, how's your, how's your prep work working in a league you've never seen and uh, you don't speak the native language? All right, so I'm going to get you good and anxious. You ready? Oh, I'll go hear for you. It. All right. Yeah. So we get lineups 30 minutes before first pitch. Oof. And then the second game I did, you get this call. 15 minutes to air. Okay, your game got rained out. We're going to do a different game. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, wow. it's and, – and look, my biggest thing is I want to pronounce the names as close as I can. I want it to be proper. I don't want to mail that part in. Um, but the other component as far as in-game is – I'm calling it off a laptop, a tiny laptop. The resolution isn't great, so that, you know, the speed to get it to me. So, I mean, on a day game the other day, I, I'm having trouble seeing the ball. You know, it's just not, it's just not s simple. And then, you know, it's, it's not a detailed thing. So, like, I've had some, you know, some people, I mean, look, it's social media, but I'm, I, I've, I've had some people like, you know, just talk about the game. And look, we don't have the the depth and breadth of knowledge in the sport to do that. But so you know, me, this the ground our, really. Yeah, this is our baseball window. So we've had some blowouts. Once it's if it's a blowout, like I'm sorry, we're going at wherever we can go. Um, but the other thing is Something simple as when a pinch hitter comes up, I don't know that a pinch hitter is up. I might recognize it, I might not, but I don't have anybody telling me that because we don't have somebody there. Yeah. When we come back from commercial, I'm saying welcome back, and I'm looking at the monitor, and I'm like, okay, this guy looks different, and then he's turning, but I can't read his name in Korean, and I'm like, is that a 5 or a 15? But the whole time I'm talking, and now I'm seeing it's a 15, and I'm still talking, and now I'm determining that, oh, okay, this is a new pitcher. And I look at my roster, and I see who 15 is, and then I tell you who the new pitcher is. That's how it works. It's not so easy, man. No, uh, I, I couldn't even put, imagine. Put in perspective, John, how, what's the percentage of you calling a game, radio or, or TV, uh, when you're at the stadium that you're actually watching the monitor because people yeah. don't understand that then when you watch a game at home you think you're you can do the same thing call yeah. and really you're you're not so radio i do it i would say i am 80 percent of the time on the field maybe 85 percent of the time on the field just because the field. yeah if you're if, if i'm in the monitor and then to the field if you lose the ball you're screwed right so i will say that because on TV you're kind of accenting it, the risk of losing the ball, you can chase the call a little bit more. So I do have a tendency to watch, I'd say maybe 40 to 50% of the time, at least the pitch off the monitor. And then once the pitch is done, the field of play, I'd say that's 50% of the time. But for the most part, I'm watching the field because that's where it is. That's where it's happening. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's. I don't think people you know, understand that, John. Yeah. yeah it's, it's so Little things that we noticed that. Right. So, but you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm doing the best I can. I want to, I'm getting information and trying to present it, you know, on these players and, but it is like, I don't know. It's just one of these – look, I'm, if I'm sitting in the booth and the field is in front of me, I can see how deep the outfielders are. Um, if it goes over the guy's head, I can see that he took a bad route. Sometimes you can see that on TV. Sometimes you don't. So there's just a lot of, a lot of stuff that, yeah, that makes it, it, makes it a, a little bit harder. So, you know, we just – like I said, we're, you know, do, doing what we can. And, and I, you know, the names I want to, um, I want to give full effort and, and try and get them correctly. And I want to try and get the information, you know, just on a basic level. Who's good? I, I want to, 
I mean, I, I think my mindset is this. Like, I'm probably more focused on the first five guys in the batting order because there is that discrepancy over there that the, these, are the, these are the good guys, these are the big boys, especially three, four, five, um, and tell those stories. And, I'll, I, you know, and then there's a tendency, you know, the best advice – not best, but one of the really good pieces of advice I got years, 1997, my first year when I did radio, Joe Angel was one of the Marlins broadcasters. And he said, you can come on and do the scores whenever you want. He said, but I would advocate not doing them when three, four, five in the order are up. Cause that's when something is most likely to happen. And as a guide, you know, that's kind of it, you know, like, don't give the Rockies Royals score when Barry Bonds is up. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's kind of it. So. Better than average chance the ball goes out of the ballpark. And, of course, in addition to, of course, your field of vision going from infinite to the size of the monitor in front of you, there's that rhythm that exists for a play-by-play -play caller with their analyst or analysts, yeah. whatever you may be yeah. working with, that is either uh, unspoken. You know, you can look at each other, exchange views, know when you're going to jump in and out. Yes. Now you're separated by thousands yes. of miles. It's a big deal. What's that conversation like? Yeah, that, that's a big deal as well. That, you know, like people don't realize nothing on a play-by-play -play front besides the open is scripted. They don't know when I'm going to stop talking, but there, there's ways you use the nonverbal – you know, so you use the body language and you use intonation and you, and it just works. And then you start, but when you're far away, it's, and it's gotten better as we've gone on, but it, yeah, it's, it's yeah. challenging for sure. Does it help that there are people that you have worked with in, in both Jess Mendoza, Eduardo Perez, and some of these other folks that you've worked with in person before? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If it was someone that I didn't know, it would be, it would take, it would take more time, but because I've worked with all three, Kyle, Jess, and Eduardo, you know, it makes it, it makes it easier. Certainly uh, can't hurt. And of course, Andre, you're, you're on the other side of things. You've been living in limbo. You know, you're waiting for, for something to begin in order to, uh, to get going. But you know when Major League Baseball throws its, its first pitch, you're going to game site, whatever that is. You can't shoot from home. Uh, you know, the broadcasters, the, the analysts, they may stay home initially, um, but you all have got to go to game site in order to bring the pictures. What do you imagine that experience is going to be like? Yeah, so there is a, there is a model where um, they will downsize whoever's on site. Now, specifically cameras, that's – right now it would be very difficult. I'm not saying it's uh, not out of the possibilities, but it would be very, very difficult, especially with what's going on right now. Um, yeah, it would be very interesting. I Just thinking about, like, going to a stadium with no fans – just that alone. And then how do we then maybe change our camera angles to decide should we show less crowd or, or less empty seats? Um, so that will be an interesting uh, conversation that we've kind of already started um, with, at least with ESPN on baseball and just, you know, get the idea of like, you know, what could we do with camera positions? If the stadiums are empty, where could we move those around? But I anticipate a very limited um, crew, um, and that's kind of all I'm just, you know, holding my hat on is just, you know, I assume the leagues are going to really regulate who's walks in that door, who's in the quarantine bubble, whichever league it is, whether it's baseball, NBA, whatever it is, um, there's going to be some sort of bubble and they're going to really limit the people there. So um, yeah, who knows really? I, I will say this. I like, I feel it's going to be challenging for you guys because there are going, I, there are just, shots I'm sure that are default shots in the crowd that just aren't available <laughs> to you you know what I mean like oh yeah but I'll also tell you and I, I, I I'm just saying this in an open-ended way but I do think it's important and that is for all the talk not to get too deep here but for all the talk of we want baseball to come back we want football to come back that's not what you mean you don't want them to play. You want them to play so you can see it. Right. And we're not going to be allowed to see it in person. So to me, I understand the health component, but like, I almost, I think that television needs to be contemplated really quickly and closely after playing. 
because like these how people, we do it people but no my point is people aren't interested in just the yankees playing and having a record they want to see the yankees play right right so like if if they're playing and it looks like some backhaul feed <laughs> and it's not like i do think that if it doesn't present well it's it's problematic it's got to be it's got to look good yeah so, you can't cover a baseball game with a you know, 20 unmanned Marshall cameras set up around right. the field. It's going to be a completely different feel. So the limiting of the technology, I don't, I don't see that happening. I think it's more like the, just the actual people on site. Yeah. Um, I, I hope we have the same amount of cameras when we go back. Um, yeah. The question is really is when we go back, will it be a world feed or will it be like a three-way when we have, you know, the home show, the away show, and the national broadcast? Or I think it'll just be one. Probably would be, my, one. would be my guess. And right. then, you know, for for us, look, I know the average person doesn't care, and, and my guess would be that most TV executives don't know and don't care. No disrespect. That's what you say after you disrespect someone, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, whatever. I mean, but my point is, like, us being on site is crucial to us really doing a good job. The interactions that we have with the players and the ability to talk to them here to there, even if it's six feet away, to humanize them, to tell their stories is so – I mean, that's one of the things that I, I will say – I mean, Dre and I have worked together a lot, and we work on a really – we worked on a really great crew together on Wednesday Night Baseball. But I think I could – I don't even know that we've talked about it so much, but I would say that Andre has been around me enough to know how I do my job off air and interact with these guys to get the stuff that I get. Mm -hmm. Like you see it, you see how I interact in order to tell these stories, to make these guys feel comfortable. Um, I just think that our best version includes us being there in order to t I'm not saying it's impossible to do the job without us being there I'm saying the very best version of what we do would include us being there I can certainly uh, agree with that uh, no uh, no question about it before I let you both go I, I gotta get at least something here on best ballparks under normal circumstances best ballparks places you guys love to go for one reason or another, what what are, what are the ones that stand out in your mind, Andre, and then John? Uh, I'm biased because I live in Massachusetts. I think Fenway Park, but I don't oh, know. Oh, think... come on! I love Fenway <laughs> too, but give me something interesting. I can go there. All give right, me something else. Uh, wow. <laughs> I mean, Camden Yards is unbelievable. Um, Wrigley Field's unbelievable. I just think the way those three broadcast those those three stadiums connect with the fans and how small they are, they really feel like the park rather than the stadium. So I always lean, if, even if it's named stadium, give okay. me the park. So, okay. uh, I, yeah, I would, say, I would say outside of Massachusetts, outside of Family Park, it would be All right, so Camden. I'm gonna, I'll answer this for me. It's not my favorite park. Give me, though, a park that, like, from a technical standpoint or something sneaky, a great park to work in that we might not think of. Like I have one for me, like one for me, Arizona is a great park yes. for me to work in. I have a low, a low point of view. The booths are wide. The tabletops are deep. You can see everything. You're in this perfect height in terms yeah. of a position. So Arizona for me is a sneaky, great place to work. Uh, for the technical side, I would say Philadelphia. Yes, uh, great place to work. Just the positions, the cameras, the dugout yeah. positions where they are on the bases. Just That's another overall, great place to work. They really got it right with yeah. a lot of the positions. Yeah, uh, but some people that might disagree yeah. with that. I don't know, but I would say I would say Philly definitely. I'd say Fenway too. By the way, in terms of my favorite place, Fenway, and then the other one would be San Francisco. Ooh, yeah, San Francisco. Francisco. Can't yeah. disagree. Getting outside of Fenway Park, there's nothing better than at home, but I, I'd say from a fan experience, uh, San Francisco is an incredible opportunity yeah. uh, as far as places to go see a ball game. ESPN's John Shambi, Andre Koroskini, thank you guys so very much for joining us here on Press Row. Hopefully we'll have you guys back again sometime. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. And thank you guys so very much, and we thank you so very much for being a part of our family here on Press Row on Rivalry Family Media. Until next time, so long, everybody.